Hey guys, so uh, I just wanted to make this video for those who may be traveling to Egypt. I just wanted to put out a huge travel notice. Um, the So I was in Egypt for about two weeks and I don't want you guys to get scammed as much as I got scammed and um, just all that. So I wanted to put this travel notice out there because I spent, there's a couple of places that I went to that I had blown absolutely big money um, and quite frankly just got scammed and um, it was one of those things where the places that I had gone to uh, were recommended by all the local people uh, were recommended online were recommended by the tour guides and all that kind of stuff so you know it was it was one of those things where um, this had the outside appearance of a you know, reputable company and, you know, so I go and spend maybe $500 in artwork uh, just to find out that essentially, you know, one of the products uh, isn't trustworthy and so if one of the products is trustworthy, are any of them trustworthy kind of thing. So, but I just wanted to put that out there. So we'll start off um, with just what to expect when you get to Egypt. Uh, when you get to Egypt, um, I was there for two weeks. I went from Cairo down to Kenna to Luxor down to Aswan, Abu Simbel, flight from Aswan back to Cairo, and then Cairo I left the country. Uh, and I did that in a span of about two weeks. So first of all, when you're getting to the airport there in Cairo, when you arrive to the airport, they're going to give you a little slip that you're going to have to fill out, and it's just the country, uh, country entry form. Uh, so you're just putting down your passport number, what you're generally there for, and a bit of your information so that the police can get in contact with you if they wanted to. Um, so you're doing that. Now, before you buy your visa and before you go through customs, you have to get a cell phone SD card. That is the easiest place to get an SD card for a cell phone is there at the airport. Um, if you go after the airport... Um, after the airport, I mean, after you leave customs, there's no stores. There's only taxis and stuff like that, buses and, and stuff like that. So once you pass customs, you go through customs and you get to the other side of customs where you can no longer re-entry, uh, no longer re-enter the terminal, you have no access to a cell phone. So here's the problem. If like me, you landed and you didn't have data, and you didn't really check your phone immediately after getting off of the plane, um, what I've, I, I kind of ended up creating a kind of shit storm for myself. So um, I was so focused on trying to get the visa situation figured out, which when you get off of the plane, the first place you get in line, if you want to make it fast, the first place you get in line is the Bank of Egypt. Right there when you get off the plane, there's a Bank of Egypt. And you go in line there and you buy a visa sticker. It's about $25, no debit cards, only cash, U.S. dollars. So uh, there's ATMs all over the place. Uh, but if you want to make it fast, it's best if you have $25 cash. And you could just go give them you know, $25 when you get off the plane. And then you're pretty much first in the immigration line. Um, there, I recommend you after you get your visa or before you get your visa sticker, also go ahead and get a stick, uh, an SD card for your cell phone so that way you can have data. Um, I didn't do this step because I was so focused on the immigration and visa side of things that once I got my sticker, I went straight through the checkpoint, straight through security, ran all my bags through their, uh, their x-ray machines and all that, and then got to the other side pulled out my cell phone to call an Uber, oops, there's no cell phone service. Um, and so now I had to go try to figure out how to get an SD card. Everybody was telling me the only way to get an SD card is to go back into the terminal. Nobody speaks English, so it's very difficult to communicate uh, with the people there. Um, and so it's just avoid the hassle, just get an SD card while you're there at the, at the uh, airport. I ended up having to like walk around till I could find a Wi-Fi and then use Uber from Wi-Fi. But nonetheless, when in Cairo, you're going to have Uber available and I highly recommend you just stick to Uber. 
All of the taxis are going to give you extremely high prices whenever you want to go anywhere. They're going to tell you 500 pounds, 700 pounds, some as much as 900 to 1,000 pounds to go somewhere. And if you look up the cost of the Uber, the Uber can be 60 pounds to 120 pounds, which is the equivalent of a dollar to a dollar fifty. Um, and so, uh, or a two dollars, a dollar to a dollar, two dollars. So, uh, I highly recommend you use Uber while you're in Cairo. The entire time that you're in Cairo, there is another app that's called In Drive. Uh, that's going to be very important for the remainder of Egypt. But while you're in Cairo, you have the option of just using Uber everywhere you go. They have the scooters, but I didn't want to run around on a scooter because of how crazy traffic is. Crossing the streets are incredibly dangerous. Being on the streets in general are incredibly dangerous um, as far as traffic goes. And so you just don't want to be on a scooter. It's best if you're in a car. While I was in Cairo, I got into three car accidents, uh, well, fender benders, uh, while I was in Cairo. So this is why I say you don't want to be in a scooter, you don't want to be walking around the streets. Um, it's best if you just just get yourself a uh, just get yourself an Uber uh, to get around. Uh, one thing that you can also do is when you're dealing with taxi people, uh, you can put put on Uber the destination that you want to go to and show them the price that you're about to pay to go on Uber and they'll be incentivized to match that price or be slightly above that price. Um, but one thing you have to make clear with them, very crystal clear, is that you are not going to change the price, period. You have to make that crystal clear uh, because they like to change things. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 100 pounds, 100 pounds, no problem. And then while they're driving, 250 pounds. No, we said 100 pounds. Oh, okay, yeah, 100 pounds. And then you get to your destination, 400 pounds. No, you said 150 pounds, right? So there's a lot of that um, shenanigans that happen everywhere. Uh, so just be mindful of that. And Uber, it's very simple. It gives you the option to tip on the app. So for the most part, you know, uh, it, it's very convenient to just Uber, pull up an Uber, throw in the little tip thing, and then just walk away because the taxi people, they typically want a tip of 100 to 200 pounds, uh, whereas with Uber, you can tip 10 to 20 pounds. Uh, so I highly recommend Uber while you're in Cairo. Let's talk about just being in Egypt in general. Um, I never really felt, now, I'm a six foot tall dude who's pretty big, so you know, take it, take it for what it is, but I never really felt like I was any, in any sort of danger uh, of being robbed or being mugged, um, not like Central America or anything like that. Um, and so, and I went into some pretty sketchy areas, dark alleys, stuff like that. Um, in Cairo, it, uh, it was a little bit more interesting, but in the other cities, I felt absolutely safe 100%. Cairo was kind of the big city. It was a little, little um, interesting as far as the feeling of safety there. But in general, I felt safe to just walk around and go around, um, which brings us to the touristy areas. Uh, there are no touristy areas. Uh, so you'll have the big fancy hotels and stuff like that. When you leave the fancy hotels to go do the touristy things, it does not feel like a touristy area. You know, in places in Europe, it'll be kind of doctored up and cleaned up so that it appeals to tourists. Uh, it's not like that in Egypt. The tourist area is just big market areas where there's gonna be trash everywhere, there's gonna be stray dogs everywhere, uh, people yelling at each other in Arabic. So very chaotic environment, an incredibly chaotic environment um, and uh, the first thing that you need to know when just walking around uh, is to not say anything to the vendors. I can't stress this. Don't say anything to the vendors uh, who are trying to sell you things if you're not interested in buying what they have to sell. Um, because you'll genuinely get bombarded 20 to 50 times every single day, and that may be an understatement, it may be more than that, but you'll be bombarded by 
everybody who wants to sell you everything. Um, your Uber driver is going to try to sell you a cruise or a hot air balloon ride. The hotel person is going to try to sell you a cruise or a hot air balloon ride. Uh, this person is going to try to sell you a Nile cruise. This person, so everywhere you go, everybody's got hands in each other's pockets, and everybody wants to sell you everything. Um, so just be careful with that. Uh, as far as the gift shops goes, whenever you're going into gift shops and you don't want to get um, if you don't want to get um, ripped off by going into a gift shop, you know a lot of the people that are taxi drivers and tourists and things like that, you'll they'll say, oh, uh, don't go, don't go to these uh, little markets here. Uh, go to these this specific factory, right? It's better quality and all this kind of stuff. Guys, there's not a difference. Granite is granite, okay? Um, granite is granite. Plaster is plaster. Alabaster is alabaster. Uh, you know, just kind of knock on the thing that you're knocking on, that you're considering buying. It should feel like a rock, right? Um, plaster, you can tell plaster is not really a rock because it, it's pretty light. And whenever you ping it, it kind of sounds like ceramic. Um, but a rock, I mean, here, let me just grab this real quick. So these are kind of two things that I picked up amongst the other things that I got. But here's a couple of things that I picked up. One is a little tiny scarab beetle that I paid. Uh, I have a funny story about this, but I mean, it's just, it's just kind of a rock, right? And you can look at it. And let's see if I can show you the translucency. Yeah, so you can see that light passes through it. So this is their alabaster. So, you know, the way you check for alabaster, you just kind of hold it up to the light and make sure that light passes through it because light isn't going to pass through ceramic. Uh, and it's not going to pass through plaster. So just hold it up to the light. If you can see through it, you can say, okay, it's stone, whether it's genuine alabaster or not. Who knows, but you know that you have a hand-carved stone sculpture. Um, so that affects the price. Same thing with this. You know, ping it a little bit. Um, and some, some, bits of, some bits are just going to kind of be questionable. This is one that I'm kind of questionable about. Uh, it's advertised to me as stone. Let's do a small scratch test real quick. So this is stone. So uh, you can do that. You could just scratch the bottom. These bases are always scratched and stuff. You can just take your keys out, scratch the bottom of the base, and if it, you know, if it stays the same color and nothing significant happens, then you know that you're dealing with a stone product. And so then, okay, yeah, it's reasonable to buy. Uh, what I do want to show you is something that I spent an absolute insane amount of money on uh, that, um, that I, I spent just an insane amount of money on that was told to be a stone and it's not a stone. It was just plaster or a cheaper ceramic or something. Um, and I spent a lot of money on this thing at one of the reputable shops. So when you're dealing with the gift shop owners, they're going to come out to you. And if you talk to one of them, you're going to talk to all of them because they all want a piece of your, of your wallet. Um, and so the best way to handle it is to not look at them and don't say anything. If you do want to address them, you can put your hand up like this just to say, you know, hey, leave me alone. I'm not interested, you know, go away kind of thing. That has been the fastest way that I've been able to get people to stop talking to me. Um, if you tell them no, they see that as an invitation to start a conversation with you. So if you, if um, if uh, you know you're walking by and hey, you know I have this little thing for a dollar. I have it for a dollar. This is not a dollar. They'll put it in your hand. You'll say a dollar. You'll give them a dollar, and they'll say, oh no, it's ten dollars. It's ten dollars. And you'll say, no, I said you said a dollar, and they'll gaslight you and extort you and do all sorts of stuff to get as much money as they can out of you. Um, and every time you put money in their hand, they just keep telling you it's more, 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 more. Um, so eventually with this, I put $3 in his hand 
um, and then just grabbed the, the way the transaction ended was I just grabbed the statue and walked away. Uh, because he, he, you know, every time I put another dollar in his hand, which is 50 pounds for them, uh, he would change the price again. I'd put another 50 pounds, he'd change the price again. I'd put another 50 pounds, he'd change the price again. So eventually I just grabbed the thing and walked away. Um, and that was kind of the end of the transaction. So there's a lot of that kind of aggressive uh, selling stuff that, that goes on, which is really unfortunate. Um, the other thing too is uh, if you go, if you decide to walk into a storekeeper's gift shop to look at things, n please note that you will be harassed the entire time. Keep that in mind. And don't, uh, if you do want to look at something, don't pick it up. Uh, keep your hands in your pocket. Don't don't grab anything that they're going to force into your hands because that's their thing is they like to just grab random shit and put it in your hands and then block you from walking out of their store. Um, so just keep in mind there's no physical boundaries. You have no bubble space. So if the shop owner is between you and the exit, just start walking to the exit. And if you walk into the shop owner, you walk into the shop owner. Um, and, you know, because they will try everything to keep you in their store. Um, and uh, if you are interested in something, you are genuinely interested in something and you want to buy it, uh, don't act like you're interested in it. And this was the hardest thing for me because sometimes you're like, oh my God, I actually want this really, really bad. You can't act like that uh, because if you do act like that, they're going to see that. They're going to give you an ex insanely high price because nothing has a price tag on it. Uh, they're going to give you a crazy high price and they want you to say yes to that high price. Um, unfortunately, me, a couple of times I did say yes to that high price and I noticed that when I said yes to that high price, all of a sudden all of these free gifts started getting thrown in there and it started making me wonder you know, why, why are you giving me so much free stuff? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, did I, did I way overpay here? And the answer was yes. Um, and so they kind of like threw extra shenanigans in there so that they didn't feel as bad, I guess, but who knows? Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, when, so you're not interested, don't even talk to them. If you say no, that starts a conversation and you'll say no, 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 no. And you'll just go on for like 50 to 100 times. And when other Egyptians see you telling a salesman no, for some reason that's like their magnet call. That's like their bat signal in the sky. You will get swarmed with people who are offering you things. And the more you tell them no, the more people will come. So you literally just seal your lips don't say a thing, don't look at them, and just motion your hand if you want, you know, and then walk quickly. That's, that's the best way that I've found to kind of deal with the, with the whole shu uh, situation. A lot of people told me, just say la shukran, which means no thank you, but it, that doesn't do anything because you're only opening up that dialogue of, oh yeah, let's, uh, let's have this conversation of why you don't want to buy my product kind of thing, so... With that being said, um, when you get to Cairo, uh, there's a couple of ways to get down from Cairo to Luxor. You can take a train, you can take a bus, you can, that's pretty much the two ways. You can take a train or you can take a bus. If you take the train, it's gonna be an overnight train and it's gonna take about 12 hours to get from Cairo to Luxor by train. I don't know the flights because I didn't fly there. I took a train. I went online on booking.com and I paid for a bus ticket to take me from Cairo to Luxor. And when I got to Egypt, uh, it turned out that that, uh, that company didn't exist. And so I had essentially just booked a company that didn't exist. $9 went somewhere out into the ether and into somebody's bank account and uh yeah so i don't recommend you booking a uh, a bus online i recommend just waiting until you get there to book your train tickets and your bus tickets which is scary for the people who like to have things planned ahead of time what's important is that you know the schedule but you don't necessarily have the ticket at the time that you have the schedule so um 
so yeah, that was my experience with that. So we went to where the buses were at. I didn't have a I didn't have a bus waiting for me like I thought I was going to have, and I went to Ramsey's train station. Went I don't know why it's lagging. I went to Ramsey's train station to uh, get the train ticket to go from Cairo to Luxor. So what I recommend is if you do decide to take the train to go from Cairo to Luxor, I recommend going in the middle of the day at noon or in the morning or something like that. Go to the uh, the foreigner's ticket office, which if you go into Ramsey's station is on the second floor there's a food court area. To the left, you'll see a small hallway and you take that hallway all the way down to the right and you'll see a big sign that says tourist foreigners ticketing booth. And that's essentially where they speak English. Uh, the thing is, getting there, nobody speaks English. So it's kind of hard to you know, get your way around once you do get there. Um, the information desk person on the first floor also speaks English. so. I was able to use him, he told me where to go, and then I went back to him to ask him which platform and how to get there. Um, and so, you know, all the whole ticket is in Arabic, so most of the time you can't read it. And it tells, he'll tell you it's this platform over there, go through those doors, take the stairs, whatever, to get to that platform, um, and then the time to be there. So there was that. The situation on the train, they're going to ask you if they can help you with your luggage. They want to do this for a tip. They want you to give them 200 pounds. So they'll you know, help you to your seat and put your bag over your head for you so that you don't have to. And they want four bucks out of the whole thing. Uh, two to four bucks for, for a tip is, is what they want. Um, most of the time, I would only tip about a dollar. Um, and a lot of people were upset about that. But, you know, I, that's what I would give them. So... Uh, the other thing is the tipping thing. Uh, when you tip a person, if you try to give them a 20 pound note or a 50 pound note, do not be shocked when they look at that and reject it. They'll give you your tip back and tell you to give you more to give them more money. Uh, this is something that I really uh, did not see coming and quite frankly shocked me because as an American, you never deal with somebody rejecting a tip telling you that the, that the tip is pathetic and demanding that you tip them more. You just don't deal with that here in the U.S., you know? Um, and Well, it seems like nowadays Starbucks does that. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so just keep that in mind. Uh, you'll pull out a 20 or a 50 and always keep small bills. Uh, you're going to go to an ATM. It's only going to issue a whole bunch of $200 bills. Highly recommend you go to a, a gas station or something like that and just, or a small store and buy a whole bunch of waters for 10 pounds or something like that and just trade out as many 200s as you can for smaller bills so that you can hand out tips here and there for people who help you out. Um, because the last thing you want to do is open up your wallet to hand out a tip and the only option for a tip is, for, is a $4 bill, right? Um, you're going to be going to an ATM a lot because their currency just isn't worth that much. So keep that in mind. So smaller, you know, and everybody wants a tip. So if you're constantly handing out these 200s for tips, you're going to have to go to the ATM more often. Um, so keep that in mind that you always want smaller bills. Um, so uh, you've gotten on your train, you've gotten on your bus, whatever. You've taken an Uber to get you all over the place. You've got your data with your SD card, and now you're ready to go to the rest of Egypt. Um, so you're hopping on your train and you're chugging along. So on the train, they will tell you uh, what stop it is. Uh, but the best way that I was able to tell what's, I'm sorry, they won't tell you what stop it is. They say it in Arabic, but they just kind of stop the train. Um, and so what I had to do to figure out what city I was at and to make sure that I got off at the right train stop was on my phone. I would, uh, on my phone, I would do Google Maps and like look at my GPS location and just see what city I was in whenever or approaching when the train would be coming to a stop. Um, so that way I can have an idea, okay, no, I'm going to the next city or yeah, I'm going to get off here or whatever. 
I got off the train in Kenna, which is a city north of Luxor, about an hour and a half north of Luxor, because I wanted to go to Dandara Temple. So uh, I had the only option they gave me was to pay for a train ticket to go from Lux from Cairo to Aswan, and then I just got off where I wanted to get off. Um, it was really hard to communicate with the guy who was selling me the ticket, so I just said to hell, just sell me the damn ticket. Um, so you get off whatever city you want to get off if you want to do it that way. Um, I wanted to go to Dandara and have plenty of time at Dandara um, Temple there uh, without having to take a bus and be on a time limit and all that kind of stuff. So I went to the uh, I went to the station there you get out of the train station there's taxi people all over the place you just approach one of them and you say hey i want to go to the temple of dandara and before you get in the taxi you say how much money is it is because at that point uber is out the window uh you say how much money is it they're going to tell you an astronomical amount you're going to tell them an astronomically small amount and you're going to find a middle ground after a little bit of haggling and then once you come to that middle ground, you're going to say, this is the price. I'm not giving you any more than that, right? You need to make that very clear. No tip, no nothing. This is the price. Okay. So then you get in the cab, you go, you pay them. Everybody's happy. Uh, in my situation, I had my taxi driver just wait there for me at the temple. And I was there for a couple of hours, two and a half hours there at the temple. Um, and... Uh, that way I could have a ride there waiting for me whenever I left uh, to go to Luxor. So taxi to Luxor, we negotiated $1,200, which is the equivalent of, I think, 24 bucks uh, to go from uh, Kenna to Luxor uh, by taxi. Sketchy experience, uh, no air conditioning, not a very comfortable ride. Sketchy dude uh, who kept taking off my seatbelt to tell me to relax. And I kept telling him, I want to relax, but you're driving crazy. That's why I have my seatbelt on. And he kept telling me, you know, he had no idea what I was saying and just kind of laughed every time I put my seatbelt on. And he would tell me, relax, relax. And then he'd unbuckle my seatbelt. <laughs> just drove me crazy. Uh, because then, you know, sleeping with both eyes open kind of thing. But um, nonetheless, uh, we got to Luxor. Now, Luxor, there is no Uber. And so all you have are taxis and water taxis. And so and a good app to download at that point that I'd mentioned earlier is called N-Drive. Uh, N-Drive is, uh, is an app. You'll have to look it up. And uh, I don't have my phone on me. But it's essentially a little green icon that has a D and uh, it's a D and then the like the vertical part of a D is an I. And so it's like an I, D, and it's a single icon and it's a green logo, kind of like a money green logo, like Cash App. Um, and that is the best app that I've been able to find as far as keeping the fares for the taxis low. Uh, also keep in mind every taxi person they're going to want to be your personal taxi. Uh, so they're going to tell you, take down my number, and whenever you need anything, call me, all this kind of stuff. Just tell people, this is the, this is the thing, just be frank with people. No, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that. It, you just have to be really frank with people. They'll tell you, no, it's okay, it's okay. No, it's not okay. I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that. Take down my number. No, I don't want to do that. Uh, you know, it, no, 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 it's fine. No, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that. Uh, and so that's something, something to keep in mind uh, is that every taxi is going to want to be your personal driver. And the reason is because they want to, you know, they want to get a lot of money out of you. And so uh, they want to, and they want to raise the fares as they go along. So when I was in Luxor, I didn't know about the app called InDrive until I got to Aswan. I'm not getting anything for this, by the way. I'm just giving you guys my experience. I don't want y'all to get taken like I got taken. Um, and so my fares in from Uber in Cairo were between 60 pounds to 150 pounds, sometimes 180 pounds. My fares in Luxor were between 250 pounds to 350 pounds, sometimes 500 to 700 pounds. 
Um, and the reason was because I was I just decided to use this one single taxi driver and his prices were always changing and it and, and over the course of the four days that I was there in Luxor, every day the fares just got a little more expensive, a little more expensive, a little bit more expensive. Um, and so highly recommend that, so I ended up spending almost, I would say probably about a hundred US dollars in taxis there in Luxor, which is just insane uh, because the market realistically you'd spend, uh, you would spend, if you did in drive, you could probably do the entire thing for maybe 20 bucks. Um, uh, and so keep that in mind while you're there in Luxor, East Bank or West Bank, try to pull out your in drive app on West Bank. It's a smaller community. You may not have the option to go on in drive. Um, but nonetheless, uh, just keep that in mind. So I spent a plenty of time there in Luxor. I rented out an Airbnb that was on the West Bank that was very beautiful. I got to see all the hot air balloons every morning for breakfast. My Airbnb host would bring me food every morning. He'd bring me dinner every evening. And the whole thing cost about $16 US per day that I was there uh, for essentially two meals plus a place to stay every day, which is a phenomenal deal. Um, and then of course, all you have to, all you have to, um, look up from that point is just the, uh, just the taxis to get there and back. Um, so water taxis. So if you live on the West bank and you're going to the East bank, or if you're on the East bank and you're going to the West bank, you're going to have to take a water taxi across the taxi driver who was young and rather naive to the tourist situation told me that the average price to take a water taxi across was a hundred pounds. Um, and this is an individual boat. You by yourself, nobody else coming with you. You're hopping on a boat with an operator and he's shuttling you across on the single boat. Now keep in mind that you can cross the river with a water taxi or you can go down the road to the ferry and ride with the Egyptians. So the Egyptians have this big ferry and they get across the river for about 10 pounds. Uh, taking a water taxi across typically costs anywhere from 150 to 300 pounds. I say 150 to 300 because my taxi driver told me it would be 100 pounds and the person I spoke to said he wanted 500 pounds and then we negotiated it down to 200 pounds to get across so I paid him 200 pounds to get me across. When dealing with the water taxis, they are going to want to sell you more stuff and they're going to want to veer you to different things. Just be upfront. No, I'm not interested. I'm not, you know, no, I don't want to talk about it. This is my business. I appreciate it. I understand that you're telling me that we're friends and we're friendly. We're not friends. You're not friendly, <laughs> you know. Just, you kind of have to just be a jerk with them um, in order to not get taken. Um, so, so I what had happened with me? We negotiated two hundred to just to go straight across the river, and I was going to go on the other side, pop around with taxis and all that kind of stuff. Uh, what ended up happening is my boat driver convinced me that he wanted to do. Uh, he wanted to go. Sorry about that. That he wanted to go uh, to Karnak Temple. He would take me to Karnak Temple. I'd get back on his boat. He'd float me up to Luxor Temple. And then from Luxor Temple, he'd float me back to West Bank. Uh, so we went from $200 just going across the river to $1,200 going from West Bank to Karnak Temple to Luxor Temple back across to Karnak Temple. And I really regret doing this because Karnak Temple was closed uh, and it just ended up costing me a lot more money, uh, you know, 24 bucks to go here, here, here. His motor ended up, you know, kind of stalling in the middle of the river. So it's just, it, it kind of created for a fun scenario. Uh, but of course, at the end of that, he wants a tip and all that kind of stuff. Uh, these guys will try to invite you to their homes. They'll try to invite you for tea. Uh, whether you want to do that or not, completely up to you. 
uh, I went and had tea with plenty of people and I went and had dinner uh, with plenty of people and never felt unsafe. Uh, but know that when you do that, strings are attached. Now they want you to be, you know, okay, call me in the morning when you want to place. And since you've kind of created a friendly bond, now you don't want to put up such strict boundaries because now you've kind of created a friendly bond, which is something that I, uh, that I did that I don't recommend doing. <laughs> so it's best just to not make, even though there were beautiful experiences, you end up paying so much more money sticking with the same drivers versus just sticking with the open market. So Luxor, a uh, very scammy place. Everybody wants you to follow them. They'll tell you you can't do things, can't do this. You have to pay money to do that if you want to do it. Um, there's no rules anywhere uh, is pretty much what you come to learn and the police are not going to get involved with the extortion efforts uh, by the local people. So don't look to the police as a way of validating whether or not you are getting extorted or not. You're getting extorted. Um, and the police are probably the ones who are helping the extortion happen. Uh, so be very careful. This is what happened to me at Pyramids in Cairo. I walked through the door. Uh, a person started yelling at me and told me that I was breaking the rules and I had to stop. And what it ended up being was a tour and he wanted to sell me a tour to go around the entire pyramid. And he said that I couldn't walk around anywhere I wanted to walk around. I had to, I had to buy his tour, this and this and that. Um, extortion, right? And the police are sitting there just watching the whole thing and they're not doing anything about those people. Uh, he comes up to you with a badge and says, I work here and all that kind of stuff. Whenever he says, you can't do it, wait until a policeman with a gun walks up to you and tells you you can't do it. Because most likely it's just some, uh, some guy who's trying to sell himself as a person who works there who is trying to sell you a tour. Uh, and on that note, uh, if you get a tour there from the locals, Understand that the price is going to always, always change if you are not an absolute hard ass on this is the price that I'm going to pay and you're not getting a dollar more. Um, I uh, negotiated $40 for a three-hour tour around the Giza pyramids and that $40 magically ended up turning into, 30, into $75 uh, because of his sob story and all this BS. Uh, and I should have just been super hard with him. Uh, you know, I'm a nice person. I should have just been super hard with him and said, you know, no, you're not getting an extra dollar. We agreed on $40. I'm going to pay you $40 and nothing more. Well, what about a tip? I'm not giving you a tip. I'm giving you $40 and nothing more. You're going to make some people unhappy this way, uh, but you're going to save a lot of money doing it that way. Uh, you know, you have to realize the entire country's economy is based off of extortion and preying on Western kindness um, and, and non-confrontation. So that's kind of their economy. So if you're a very pushover person, they'll take all of your money in a matter of a week. So Luxor, water taxis, the temples, you just give them a credit card to pay for the temples. You can't pay the temples with cash. You can't pay any admission fees with cash. You have to ha use Visa. Um, and you're getting around these temples. People are going to want to take pictures of you. Te people are going to tell you, hey, come over here, come over here. They're going to want to start conversations with you. Every single, one of the, every single one of those people are doing it for money. Keep that in mind. If they're telling you to follow them, it's going to cost you money. If they're telling you, hey, let me take a picture for you, it's going to cost you money. Everywhere you go, if somebody is trying to be nice to you, there is an intention of this is going to be either 200 pounds, about 200 pounds for that. Because if you give them a 50, they're going to handle, hand it back and tell you that's pathetic. Give me more money. Um, and so, you know, whether or not you want that or not, it's up to you. But I just wanted to make it transparent what's going to happen when you get there so that you know what to expect. Genuinely, I would have wished, I wish that I would have watched a video like this because, um, I really just did get taken bad. Um, so in Luxor, there is a company called the Alabaster Factory, and it is where they supposedly create 
uh, handmade uh, statues and all sorts of things uh, to sell to you. Um, and it's good quality, uh, good quality, and uh, and uh, th this this is big, the biggest scam, I think. Um, you go out front and you have these guys who've got a big chunk of alabaster and they're whacking it away. They're whacking away at it with a tool and they got another guy who's sitting there with a file and he's sitting there filing this thing into a vase and you have another dude who's sitting there, you know, with a drill and he's sitting there drilling into this thing and they're showing the process of how they used to make these pots. Um, what I noted was that the pots that they were producing outside looked nothing like what they had for sale inside. Um, so keep in mind that the there is a big difference between handmade circles versus chalked up onto a lathe and carved down on a lathe. Um, in Italy, they'll take the alabaster vases, they'll chalk them up on a lathe, and they'll create a vase in a matter of five to ten minutes. Uh, whereas at the alabaster factory on the West Bank in Luxor, they're going to tell you that it takes them 20 to 25 days to make this single alabaster vase that they want to sell to you for $160 to $190. Um, so, uh, I, I bit the bait and I took the bait and I bought a couple of things from them. I bought three or four pieces and it cost me $550. And I bought a Key of Life Ankh that was supposed to be made from malachite stone. And uh, so I bought a Key of Life Ankh and then I bought a... Uh, what else did I buy? I bought a small Anubis statue that was supposedly an antique that was 105 years old. Uh, and then I bought a, a Sistrum uh, that was also supposedly alabaster. Uh, the Sistrum appears to be alabaster. Uh, and it, you know, so I don't know as to whether or not I got taken on that. And it does appear to be hand carved. Uh, but that was a very cheap thing compared to the other things that I had uh, that I was desiring to purchase, which was the Malachite Key of Life. Um, and this is what I wanted to show you. So give me just 30 seconds to grab a Malachite alligator that I bought and the Malachite Key of Cro uh, Key of Life that I bought, and I wanted to show you the difference. So. Just a minute. So this is the um, this is the malachite uh, key of life that I bought. Okay, is it actually malachite? No, it's uh, plaster. So you could scratch. Oh, you can't scratch with that. Let me grab my keys. So I didn't do this until after I got home and I wondered to myself, you know, that doesn't really look like malachite. That appears more painted than anything. Um, so I took the back of it and I just kind of scratched it with my key. And uh, I don't know if you could see that white scratch there. Uh, essentially, it's not malachite. It's, uh, it's like, it's either alabaster or plaster. By the way the bubbles look on the back, I would say this is probably plaster or ceramic that was poured. But uh, but yeah, so I paid a ton of money for this because this was supposed to be malachite. And uh, you scratch it on the back and the green paint comes off and it comes off white. Uh, and I paid $90 or something like that for this piece or maybe it was 95. I think I paid nine. I don't know what I paid. I don't even want to know what I paid. I got taken. <laughs> um, I paid a shit ton of money for this piece. 
And, uh, and so this was supposed to be malachite. It's not malachite. And I just got scammed is what it kind of came down to. You know, I probably, realistically, I probably paid about $150 to $175 for this uh, because it was supposed to be malachite and it's just ceramic uh, or plaster. This I bought at a tiny little roadside in the middle of the market, one of those little old, you know, just random gift stores that nobody walks into kind of thing that they tell you, don't go there, this is bad quality, this is bad quality. It's just a little alligator that's also made out of malachite. And if you look at the bottom, it's polished and the pattern actually looks like malachite. Uh, this does not look like malachite. That looks like painted plaster. This looks like malachite. You can see the difference in just the color. This is very dark. This is very light. So keep that in mind. Also, when you scratch the bottom of this with a key, Oh, that kind of hurts me a little bit. You can see it's lighter, but it's still green, right? It's not like uh, it's not like this key of life where you scratch the bottom of it. You scratch the bottom of it and suddenly it's completely white. Um, this remains green. So uh, I can believe that this is genuinely malachite uh, and this is just plaster. This I paid $4 for. This I paid $195 for. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Yeah, I don't know. But just keep that in mind. Uh, that way you don't... Uh, you don't kind of, you know, because they have all these guys out in front of the alabaster factory and they're working and they're doing all of this churning and all this, you know, filing and they're convincing you that they make these things from hand and it takes them 20 days to make a single vase and they're selling that vase for a, a couple hundred dollars. When in reality, if you look at the vases, it is too perfectly circular to actually be handmade. You see some of them down in the bottom that are imperfect and they are very much imperfect in their, you know, and how circular they are and all that kind of stuff. That's when you know it's handmade and it's not actually just chalked up in a lathe and cut with a lathe. Um, the lathe pieces take maybe 15 to 20 minutes to make uh, and realistically, they're gonna try to sell it to you for $250 uh, and you can buy them on eBay for $15 to $45. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, and then the antique uh, Anubis statue that I bought for $250 to $275. The antique Anubis statue, uh, you can buy them on eBay for $149 that are also claimed to be antique. Whether they're actually antique or not, you can't tell. They're not dated. Who knows? Um, but just keep that in mind. Uh, so a lot of, lot of scam things going around. Um, so that's something that you have to be uh, careful about. Um, so... That pretty much wraps up Luxor. Just be careful of the Alabaster Factory. Um, they, they, the guys are so nice to you. They give you so much to drink. They'll give you waters. They'll, they're incredibly wonderful people. And then they just give you a, a price that just absolutely fucks your budget. Um, and his initial price, the starting price that he gave me for three pieces, this fake Malachite cross, the supposed antique Anubis statue, which I don't know if it's genuinely antique or not, and an alabaster sistrum. Um, the price for all three, hand-carved and all that kind of stuff, uh, came out to $1,000. It was like $950 US dollars or something like that for those three. And so I had negotiated down to 500 thinking I was doing pretty okay with a huge chunk of malachite, you know, with a big, huge malachite cross. 
but it's not malachite. It's just a chunk of plaster. So it's a big scam. Don't fall for their stuff. Everybody's going to try to take you there. The tour guides are going to try to take you there. The uh, taxi people are going to try to take you there. Everybody wants to take you there because they get commission from the sale. Um, so, you know, my the the guy that I had made friends with who had taken me to his ho to home to have dinner with his family and all that kind of crap, you know, he had told me, hey, you know, don't negotiate too much with these people. This is really good stuff. You know, and the reason why he told me not to negotiate is because he wants his commission to be higher. Um, so yeah, keep that in mind. Uh, it's an absolute ripoff, um, and uh, don't do it. Just don't do it. Um, and then also uh, in Luxor, I was taken to a government place where they assured me this is a government place. Uh, this is really good quality stuff, hand qual hand carved stuff, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it was kind of like a slate. You'll see it when you get there. Slate hand carved of the different gods and the pharaohs and stuff like that and they're painted um, I spent a hundred and fifty dollars at this government place where these were handcrafted by artisans and students and you know you go to one of the little shops there in the market you see the exact same little hand carved plates going for twenty five to forty dollars um, so keep that in mind um, if you like something just buy it um, don't don't let somebody convince you that it's bad quality and you have to go to this special store to buy it because that's better quality. All that means is that the person who took you there is getting commission from it. Um, and just just don't do it, guys. Just don't do it. So I learned the hard way. Spent about a thousand bucks on things that realistically the value is only maybe 200 to 300 bucks. Um, and uh, yeah tears the whole time but uh but um keep that in mind it's finishing now from luxor to aswan i got there you can get there by train you can get there by bus i took a private ride that i found on viator uh it was uh a ride from Aswan from from Luxor to Aswan single day and they had the option of stopping at all three temples I highly recommend doing that one but you have to leave early in the morning so my departure time was eight o'clock at night eight o'clock in the morning I really wish I would have chosen a departure time of five to six o'clock in the morning uh, and the reason is because my driver at the end of the very last temple that we stopped at was kind of pressuring me to hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And everybody pressures you to hurry up. It's your damn vacation. Take your damn time. Um, so, you know, they, they're, they're just pressuring you to hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And for him, it was the end of the day. It was around five, six o'clock in the evening and he had to drive all the way back. So for me, I completely understand as to why he would want to hurry me up. Uh, I chose eight o'clock departure time where if I would have chose five in the morning departure time, I probably would have had more time there at the temples. Um, so highly recommend that. But when going from Luxor to Aswan, uh, you can do the buses and take the day trip tour from Luxor to go to uh, Esna Temple. I highly recommend Esna Temple because the colors there at the temple are just insane. Um, so I recommend the stop in Esna. The stop in Edfu is a big temple, gorgeous temple. Recommend that if you can stop there. Um, and then, of course, Kamombo is a place that's dedicated to their crocodile god. Uh, they've got a whole bunch of mummified crocodiles. The temple itself is pretty, you know, torn apart. There's not a lot there. Uh, but then they have the crocodile museum on the other side of the temple where they have a whole bunch of mummified crocodiles. And it's just, for me, it's worth the stop. If you can stop, stop. Um, so I bought the ticket from Viator, it was $160 to go from Luxor to Aswan, stopping at the three temples, Esna, Edfu, and, um, and uh, Komombo on the way down. And I highly recommend that. I thought that was a good price. Uh, it was $120 US, 
or a hundred and it was $120 US and I just felt like it was worth the money for uh, being able to stop and see those temples. Uh, they're gorgeous temples. The one at Esna, the, uh, the color on that temple is genuinely insane. Uh, I didn't see colors that good anywhere else in, in the, during the entire trip. So if you can stop at Esna, I highly recommend stopping at Esna. Um, Edfu is just a big temple that's super cool. It's really beautiful. Um, and uh, it's not really great for colors, but it's just a gorgeous temple and it's a great temple. Um, and then the one at Komombo, the temple is, is kind of torn apart. It's a bit run down. There's not a lot of walls and stuff like that. So it's, it's, pretty been, it's been pretty run through. Um, but the cool thing about the temple in Komombo is that you have the Crocodile Museum on the opposing side of the temple where you get to see mummified crocodiles and stuff, which I thought was pretty cool, worth the, you know, five bucks that you pay to go into the temple. And then, of course, they drop you off at wherever your hotel is in Aswan. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah. Uh, in Aswan, uh, I didn't have a place to stay lined up when I initially, li when I initially got to Aswan. I had booked my place about two days before I left Luxor, and I chose a place off of Airbnb, and um, I highly recommend that you scroll through all the pictures on Airbnb and try to see if it is clearly defined what you're going to be sleeping in. Um, so I ended up sleeping at a spot called Go In Backpackers, Found that off of Airbnb for like 12 bucks a night or something like that. And it was pretty good. Um, I had some issues with some taxi people not wanting to go there because it was kind of like in the in the village, if you would. Dirt roads getting into there and it's kind of confusing getting around the streets. Um, and so it can kind of be confusing to the taxi drivers there. So I just kept using the drive in drive. And if a taxi driver canceled on me, I would just, you know, hail another taxi driver and just keep attempting until somebody came to pick me up. That didn't happen too often. Uh, maybe twice in the week that I was there. Um, and so, uh, and then I also just recommend if you do decide to stay there, that you remember a route to get in and out because most often you're gonna to have to be telling the taxi drivers how to get into that. If you stay at a big hotel, good for you. I, I opted to stay in a smaller hostel uh, because I wanted to spend money at different parts of the trip. I didn't necessarily wanna spend money on the hotel part of the trip. So I gotta finish pretty quick, say, pretty quick here. Um, in Aswan, if you stick to the InDrive app, uh, you're not going to get taken as far as the taxi fees. Once again, everybody's going to try to sell you stuff. Uh, but just, you know, no thank you and just move on with your life. Um, and Feluca, you can do a Feluca if you want. I didn't do a Feluca because I've sailed plenty of other times in my life and it just wasn't something that appealed to me. You get plenty of water time in a boat in Luxor, so I just didn't really care for Aswan. Aswan, I did the um, Fila Temple, which was really worth the money. Um, and then I did the, um, oh, I forget. There's another temple that's in Aswan uh, that I, oh, the Unfinished Obelisk and then Isis Temple. The Isis Temple in Aswan, I wouldn't recommend going there. It's just run down. There's trash everywhere and there's not much left of the temple. So you spend about $8 to you know, just really, it's not a great temple to visit. So if you want to, go for it. Uh, the Isis temple is just really run down. I recommend going to Fila. Fila is also an Isis temple, but it's very well put together and gorgeous. Um, uh, so you can take a taxi. Oh, I'm gonna finish this up quick. Jeez, an hour. You can take a taxi. You can take a taxi from uh, from Fila to, uh, I mean, from Aswan down to the Fila docks, and there you get the taxi cost about 150 pounds to get you there, or I'm sorry, 60 pounds to get you there to the Fila temple, and then when you get to the to the Fila temple docks, sorry, uh, you have to pay a 
a, a water taxi to take you to the temple because it's on an island. The water taxi, if you can convince yourself to go with a group, just say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm here alone. I'd like to go with a group with you guys. And if you can get on board with going to the group, negotiate your little thing on the side. Okay, I'll pay him 200 and you pay him another 250 or something like that. Then that's great. Um, they you when you're in the group you have to be a part of the group so now you're their friends you're their family whatever because when the taxi people see that you're trying to get a discount they want you to go on your own separate boat uh so it and the prices are all different um i paid 700 pounds uh, a buddy of mine paid 450 pounds and then another group paid uh 500 pounds um, so they're paying 500 pounds, splitting it up between the entire group. I'm paying 700 pounds all by myself. Um, so if you can, you know, hop on a group and go across with somebody, I just recommend you do that. You save money that way. Um, and then of course, you know, you could pop a taxi back from Fila going to Aswan. Komombo, I went during the Sun Festival. Um, I... I don't really recommend going to Sun Festival. Uh, you 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 leave Aswan at eleven o'clock at night to go to Abu Simbel. It's a long ass drive. I had no idea because I slept for half of it how long it took to get there. But we left at eleven o'clock at night. We got there at four forty five in the morning, and you're in line by five o'clock in the morning, uh, and you are just waiting for the sun to come up at seven o'clock in the morning. So. It's like a concert. Everybody is pushing past each other. You're bumping into people, standing in line for two hours, no entertainment. So you're just sitting there in the dark for two hours waiting for the sun to come up with a whole bunch of people in your space. So I don't recommend the Sun Festival unless you really, really, really want to be there for the event. Then just keep in mind you're going to be standing for two hours bumping up against people who are trying to push past you the entire two hours that you're standing there in line. Um, everybody's going to be pushing past you. It's like a concert. It's very much like a concert, like whenever I was in Ibiza. Um, and so, so the whole Sun Festival thing, it's a lot of fun. The bus is going to tell you to be back on the bus by 7 o'clock, which the sun doesn't come up until 7 o'clock. So how are you supposed to be back on the bus by 7 o'clock? Realistically, your bus is going to leave at about 7.45 to 8 o'clock that's when I noticed that all the buses started taking off. So it gives you time when the sun comes up at seven o'clock. You don't have to feel like I felt insanely rushed to get through everything. Um, you can take your time a little bit, go to the gift shop, buy something or get some drinks. Take your time to go to the Abu Simbel temple. Look to the right, there's Nefertari. You can go over there and go in the temple there, but don't feel rushed because I felt rushed. They said seven o'clock back on the bus and the sun is coming up at seven o'clock, you know? So I wasn't out of Abu Simbel temple until about 7.15. Um, so I just very quickly ran to the other temple, ran to get a drink and then ran to get back on the bus. And I waited on the bus for like 30 minutes, 35 minutes. And, you know, realistically I could have gone and you know, that's time sitting on a bus that I could have spent in the temples or shopping around or whatever. So keep that in mind. Um, and yeah, that was pretty much the entire trip. From there, I went to the airport in Aswan, where you go through like, it feels like six security checkpoints to get through into your airplane, uh, to fly to Cairo. And then, you know, at that point, you're at Cairo airport, do whatever you want. Um, but that was my experience. I just wanted to make this video because, you know, I I didn't get a hold of everything and dealing with the Egyptian people until I got to Aswan. And at that point, I had already lost maybe twelve to $1,500 um, in just getting taken. So I don't recommend that, you know, if, if you, I know this is a long video, but if you can sit through it, it will save you so much money. Um, so I highly recommend that, that you just, you, you do that. Don't eat the local food. Last point, if you've made it to this point, congrats, uh, you know, the few, the proud. <laughs> um, uh, if you do make it a point, I highly recommend you bring with you anti-parasitic medication. Um, so 
How do you get that? For me, I just went on Amazon and bought some fembendazole, and I took some fembendazole with me, um, and took some fembendazole pills with me, um, and uh, I ended up eating some local food, and I ended up getting a parasite from the local food, and it didn't it didn't bother me at all because I was able to just pop some fembendazole tablets the second I felt like oh this was some bad food. I popped some tablets for antiparasitics and the problem went away within, you know, maybe four hours and I only lost half of a day on vacation. If I didn't have those antiparasitic medications on hand, I could have lost a day or maybe two to three days on, on vacation uh, depending on how bad you let the, uh, the infection get before you can get to a pharmacy get seen by a doctor or get to a pharmacy to get antiparasitics and all that kind of stuff. I don't know how that process goes. Um, I ended up having to go to the emergency room in Cairo, which I'll just put it in this video. This video is already insanely long. Um, if you want to do any sort of medical treatments or anything like that, it's not bad to do them in Cairo. If you have any sort of ailments that you want to get looked at, it's not bad to do it while you're in Cairo. Um, the medical system there is insanely cheap um, and if you have dental work that's kind of one thing I wish I had known because I need dental work um, I didn't realize how cheap everything was there so I didn't take advantage of how cheap the dentist stuff was um, because I didn't realize how cheap it was until I had my incident that I had to go to the ER my ER bill they did a cardiac test on my heart to make sure that I wasn't having a heart attack um, and they did a couple of blood tests and stuff like that. My cardiac bill came out to $18 US and they ran me upstairs because they were a bit concerned. They ran me upstairs to the cardiac specialist, cardiologist, cardiac specialist. Uh, they ran me upstairs to the cardiologist where I went through even more tests and they did ultrasound on my heart and a few other tests. Um, and uh, to just you know solidify because I was about to get on a 15 hour plane flight I didn't want the issues that I was having to be a heart attack and then get on a 15 hour plane ride um, and so uh, and the heart specialist uh, cardiologist all of his tests ended up costing me 18 US dollars so 18 US dollars for the cardiac specialist about 15 to 16 bucks for the ER visit for the entire experience where in the United States it would have cost me twenty five to thirty thousand dollars, I got out for about thirty bucks. Um, so you know, I might be heading to Egypt anytime I need any sort of medical th treatment, but it's just insanely cheap there. So I went to the NIH, the Nozal no or Nosal, whatever, International Hospital. Um, so yeah, I mean if you're if you happen to have any sort of medical issues or, or you get a cut or you have to go to a hospital don't be afraid to go to a hospital there and oh I need travel insurance because it's gonna cost so much money I didn't have any travel insurance I went paying cash and the ER visit and a cardiac specialist uh, both were 30 bucks I mean that's not even the cost of travel insurance at that point so you know, take it for what it is. If you're going to a European place, then sure, travel insurance is good. But as far as Egyptian medical prices, I, I just didn't need travel insurance. It, I mean, it's pennies uh, that you pay for the for the medical uh, health care there. Um, so if you need dental work, take uh, take advantage of the dentistry stuff that they have there. I didn't because uh, I uh, didn't realize until three hours before I left uh, Cairo how cheap the medicine was there so if I had you know had my chest pain earlier on in my trip and had gone to a hospital sooner then I might have also decided to go to a dentist while I was there but oh well okay that's the end of the video if you guys got through it congrats and yeah the camera's off and I'm off see y'all later